Hello, and welcome to another Infinite Summer 2023 developer interview. I'm really excited about this one. I have William here, who is the creative director working on Witches of the New World. We're very excited for this one. I'm personally really excited for this game. It looks amazing. William, tell us a little bit about yourself, what you do, and tell us a little bit about what's going on with this game. All right. Hello, Jesse. Um, so yeah, um, Witches of the New World uh, is uh, an upcoming third-person Souls-like game, uh, which takes place at the height of the witch hunting craze in New England, uh, the end of the 17th century. Um, so yeah, uh, I personally come from Venezuela, uh, where I worked there as a um, creative director in an advertising company and then you know I did a little bit of cinema a little bit of concept art I got to work with some uh you know foreign uh, video game companies and then when I come to Mexico uh I'm fine you know there were small video game operations here so yeah one thing led to another and well here we are now that's awesome uh I'm very excited for this so thank you for sharing uh what, let's just dive in and talk about the game a little bit. You mentioned it's a Souls like. Okay. Let's elaborate on that. Yes. Tell, tell us what type. Of, so at this point, um, we're still you know working on some background information. So for those of you watching, uh, we're going to have something in the background for this game, but we're not 100 if we're going to have full gameplay or just a trailer for you. But I would really like to just learn a little bit more about like what type of game is it, what what type of perspective, what type of content. Like just tell us everything that we need to know about the game so far. All right, so um, yeah, basically, uh, we just came from the. It was actually my my personal necessity as a gamer to play another Castlevania, <laughs> and uh, yeah, so I, I everything comes from that. Basically, um, I said, well, I'm, what if we develop uh, some sort of monster hunting games more on the religious side instead of you know the fantastical side in something that you got like you know The Witcher Three or The Witcher overall series. Um, so yeah, after that, I, I, I'm a huge fan of Robert E. Howard and, uh, oh, cool. and, and yeah, uh, Solomon Kane, uh, basically, and uh, obviously Conan the Barbarian, but yeah, um, by the time that I was developed, the, the, that I was like thinking on the idea, uh, Funcom bought, uh, all the Robert E. Howard state, most of it. So I figured, well, um, let's present an idea, solid concept for a Solomon Kane game and let's move on with it. Uh, but then I, I stumbled up across the the, Sal the Salem historical facts, uh, the witch trials, and it was very interesting to me. After all, uh, even in, in things like Dungeons and Dragons and that kind of games, I mean, the witches as, as a mythological monster has always been one of my favorite monsters. So it was difficult to reconcile Solomon Cain as a character with the the timeline of the witch hunting craze. So uh, actually my, read, my lead writer was the one who recommended, you know, going through the Solomon Kane comics and short stories like, well, create your own Puritan, you know, and let's let's do our own thing. Uh, so we did just that. I mean, we we match up uh, some of the elements of the, of the Castlevania um, series uh, in the early development, uh, you know, kind of like this metroidvania style of go back and forth in the in the level design and that kind of stuff and um then we start toying with the idea of some supernatural uh elements that prevent the character from dying and you know one thing led to another and we ended up going like well it needs to be a souls like <laughs> based alone <laughs> on the on the death mechanic and uh yeah uh we basically expand on the idea a little bit so 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 far as far as i know at least there hasn't been a fully horror based souls like game so that was kind of the 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 way to go for us and uh yeah i mean i, I proposed it uh to my boss i mean i i, I worked uh, at the time we we only we were only doing services for other video game companies uh you know i i presented like four or five pitch pitches of different games and that's the one that caught everyone's attention uh, from the board. So, yeah, we we started we started working on it more seriously. I know the the Soulsborne genre is only growing in popularity, especially yeah. in the indie space, and especially with last year with Elden Ring bringing that genre even more mainstream. For those people who maybe aren't haven't dived into a Soulsborne game or a Souls Souls like in any way, um, they maybe didn't play Elden Ring or they didn't get into it like. To an outsider of that genre, if you were to explain that to our audience, uh, other than just the what people know about it is 
the Souls likes are known for their difficulty. Difficulty, but, of course. But beyond that, is there more to a game that makes it a Souls like that beyond difficulty? And how would you explain that in your own words? Well, it, it, for me, you know, because l- like you said, it's always about the difficulty, and and that might be uh, misleading even in some cases because you have example like, for example, a Fallen Order, which you can play, you know, in easy difficulty. Uh, but yeah, to me, it's more about the the interconnected level design which uh, there's a couple of souls like that doesn't have it like neo which have very linear levels uh but mostly uh, at least to me what it, what is appealing to me from the from the genre is the yeah the interconnected level design and the way that you tell the story through the level design actually uh playing for example um mortal shells uh which is also also made by, by a small th- team i realized that uh, it's it's a very surreal way to tell a story so actually, when we were, you know, uh, cutting and hacking uh, the budget of the game, I went, I, I lean a little bit more into, into that, even though the, we do have uh, some sort of a dialogue system. Um, yeah, most of the mythology behind the witches uh, that you hunt in particular is going to be presented through the visual narrative of the level design. So, so yeah, the, the interconnected maze-like level design of old, which is something that we can see since things like Castlevania Symphony of the Night. You don't know exactly where where to go and also the the you know hands free approach into how you present the objective to the to the player. It's what to me defines the genre more even than the typical difficulty. No, I like that. I like that. Just I, I thought it'd be good to just hear it from a developer uh for those that maybe have heard heard that term or heard that genre and just hear it in a developer's words better than I could articulate what exactly a souls like could be beyond just hard games because there's there's yeah. hard games that aren't souls likes and there are to your own point with uh, fallen orders it doesn't have to be that hard because uh, it offers an easy mode so like there's like what exactly does that genre look like so it helps us prepare to understand a little bit more about like what yeah. uh, witches is going to be um how long has uh witches of the new world actually been in development um well actually i started toying with the idea on my side since like 2017 i have some other games that i was planning to develop some of them were way out of budget <laughs> so uh <laughs> so yeah that was kind of a happy find uh, and yeah, afterwards, I, I presented, I believe, uh, at the end of uh, 2021 to the team. And we formally started working around that fourth quarter of 2021, very slow, you know, pre-production, concept art, a little bit of this, a little bit of that. And and, and of course, it was a, a very uh, heavy historical investigation uh, part. And uh, yeah, it, it, in the end, um, I believe that that's, that's what drawn to me. I was drawn to to, you know, try to tell this um this witch trial thing from my own perspective uh because yeah the literature is very heavy uh, uh horrible things were were committed and done uh so yeah i i again coming back to robert e howard i uh i i tried to do something similar to what he does in the in conan with the hyborian age in which you have like this uh, very heavy criticism and also this uh, weird glorification of the most savage part of the human condition through Conan, which is a very horrible <laughs> world to live in. Uh, but there is some appeal to it uh, as to the freedom uh, uh, outside of the boundaries of society that he has. So, so yeah, basically, of course, we are we are going to to present, uh, you know, real demons and real monsters that the character is going to to fight in the game uh but you you also going to encounter you know moral dilemmas around uh, people that is uh, accused of witchcraft but they aren't actually witches <laughs> uh so yeah it's there's a little bit of play uh with that that actually uh makes me think of another question you mentioned i want to circle back to something that you said earlier yeah. about you mentioned that it, it's it's like religious fantasy rather than like true fan- fantastical settings yes. what um, and that, and that, that part intrigued me as, as someone who's like, we, I, I don't feel like we get enough of like the religious fantasy settings. Like one of my, I think one of my favorite examples, one of my all time favorites is uh, Dante's Inferno. That mm. would be an example of like a, a religious fantasy type setting. Like, would, would you say that this is something like the religious fantasy, does it lean very heavily into fictional elements? Or are you pulling from real world? Like on a scale of like historical to fiction, did you guys create 
a, a religion that it's based on or is it using like historical medieval settings like tell us a little bit like what is the origin a little bit of the lore and would love to just know more about the lore set for this game okay so uh yeah i would say 50 50 i mean uh, um actually uh the the overall the, the overarching idea behind this game is to is to be able to do it again uh in another uh, historical setting and with another set of characters and uh, yeah my my writer is actually a, a bit of a history buff I myself and I'm and, you know aficionado to to history so yeah I mean we have a lot of accurate histor historical elements um, and we used a lot of, of people that were actually recorded uh, into the into the witch trials event of uh, 1962 and 63 okay. and uh I'm sorry, 1690, 92 and 93. I'm sorry. <laughs> um, so yeah, and then we have the the obviously fantastical elements in which you actually get, uh, you know, demonic creatures and the witches themselves and the witches and warlock that, that you're hunting in, Sa in Salem, they create like their own realms where they protect their source of power. And this is where we are able to do, you know, the interconnected maze-like uh, type of level that you get in the souls-like uh in the souls like genre because of course the salem as a port which is kind of a, the main hub of the game you know it's you know there are houses and there is a port and there are stores and and then you have a forest and it's very and it's pretty straightforward in the way that it is distributed and we're trying to do you know a, a particular section of the salem actual town from that uh from that era so yeah um actually we created the realms as a way to you know exploit the overall fantastical element that is uh, that is behind the game, and yeah, in that regard, we get we get to toy with some of the more superstitious elements of you know Puritanism and other pagan you know beliefs that some of the witches are are withholding you know from Celtic to you know Voodoo uh, and that kind of stuff. Um, so yeah, I believe that 50, 50, 50 is is the most reasonable. <laughs> thing to say for now but of course you know we are doing it's, it's kind of like uh assassin's creed where you get a lot of historical characters but you also have you know your secret societies your this and that and uh, actually the character itself uh, i mean I'm, I'm i'm not going to spoil overall the, the game but he's not uh what it seems and he does not serve uh what it appears to be the the organizations that he serves to so that's why he has the, the liberty to act differently uh when you compare it to you know the witch finders of the of that time yeah it's funny that you should mention that because i was actually gonna i was gonna mention that if you hadn't about it, the way you were describing this kind of blend of historical and f fantastical elements uh it, it was reminding me a little bit of assassin's creed i was gonna almost say it, it sounds like assassin's creed with witches and sorcery and stuff yeah um, which is kind of cool uh because i'm a huge assassin's creed fan i have all of them and i'm just it's it's something i'm really passionate about and i love the the alternative history and the way that they tell history but not quite and it yeah. sounds a little bit like that's a lot of inspiration for you guys yeah i mean it, it, it's a great inspiration of course i mean we're going in uh, gameplay wise uh, we're going in a different route and also well it's basically assassin's creed uh in the in the fantasy side they go they, they lean more into the sci-fi yeah, uh, elements of of fantasy, uh, while we are going full blown horror because yeah, the, the idea is basically to take the the classic monsters, you know, your witches, your werewolves, your vampires, and uh, you know, toy with them in different games across across different uh, timelines. Uh, of course, if this one is successful, <laughs> uh, but yeah, uh, and I, like I said, I mean, the the very first thought was Castlevania, so obviously vampires are there up there. <laughs> on the list but yeah i decided to go with witches first because uh, i i rarely see uh games where are depicted as as villains mm -hmm. um also usually you are the witch which is also pretty cool i remember things like Vionetta or, or games like that uh but yeah um the idea of a, of a witch hunter as league uh, at least aesthetically to me uh you know precisely by the kind of attire that you can see in characters like solomon kane or for example uh that you can see in the in the recently released um what is this called from Frog Frog Games, I believe. Frogwares. Um Gridfall. Oh yeah. Uh, which is in a similar time frame, not mm -hmm. exact, not not quite leaning into the horror aspect of uh of the colonial times. But yeah, it basically it's a horror based fantastical uh Assassin's Creed, if you think about it. No, that's a good example. Yeah, I like that. Uh one of the things I want to do with these interviews is to help gamers 
start to understand a little bit of like what their experiences look look like. So that's why we like to learn a little bit about the lore and and the the, the setting and stuff. Let, now let's, let's talk about the characters. Like you mentioned earlier, that there is a main character. Is it yeah. a, is it a preset named character? Do you do? Is there any customization involved? Is it or is it like preset like an existing character with a narrative focus? Like what is that? Can you tell us a little bit about the like the main character? Anything? To, what can you tell us about them? Yeah, um, actually, yeah, the main character is called Jedediah Hopkins. Uh, he's actually, he's the fictional grandson of a, of a historical figure, which is Matthew Hawkins, which is a famous witch, witch finder that killed like 94 people before he was 26. <laughs> uh, yeah, not a nice guy. Uh, but yeah, so, but you know, uh, Jedediah uh, has a lot of conflict in it because he, uh, his sister was killed and accused and killed. For being a witch and he was approached with this particular organization to do things differently so this doesn't happen again uh so basically he you know he has this moral dilemma on his hand because he's also a witch finder or witch hunter but he does things differently he, ha he actually goes for demons and monsters and not innocent people that look different or something like that um so yeah, uh, he's he's uh, originally from Essex, and he ends up in Salem in the aftermath of the witch trials. And there, well, you're going to have a reference to some of the characters that participate in the in, during the witch trials. Like you know, you're gonna you're gonna meet maybe Cotton Matter, which is a, a character, a, a historical character that actually wrote a book a year after the trials about his experience as a as a witness. And you're going to have mention of, of you know, the, the child that started the accusations. And, uh, yeah, you're going to have a meet, mix match of, you know, historical and uh, fictional characters. Uh, a little bit of, of, of romance options there for the player. But, yeah, the character is 100% uh, preset with his own background. I mean, we, we, we toy with the idea of a character creation, but also because of, uh, you know, budget constraint and the type of story that we want to tell, uh, we find that it was important for the character to be just, you know, the character that we're introducing to the people. And like you can see in The Witcher or Fallen Order or, or Vampire, even, even, I mean, it's not too common for the Souls-like genre, but there, there's also a, a lot of precedence. Yeah. of it so yeah and, and when it comes to comes customization well you have uh, outside of different weapon builds and uh attires which is going to be on the vein of you know the shell the mortar shells you're going to have different types of attire and different types of, of builds with cosmetics changes but nothing as complex and you know a full-on customization system with where you can change your boots and combine it with these gloves and nothing like that uh more of a you know predefined um entire uh, clothing compositions and uh, of course in the side of the build uh, you're also going to have a faith system which is basically the magic that you use in the game that is going to be defined by by the, the morality of your character so you can move it around uh, basically you have uh, three different trees um, depending on your actions and the way that you engage with both uh, enemies and the people of Salem uh, your morality is going to be moving from one side to another. It's, it's not going to be as obvious as light versus dark. It's going to be a little bit, you know, ambiguous sometime. And uh, depending on that, uh, you're going to be unlocked to certain powers from each tree uh, at, at center point of time. So there, basically, the player can custom make his own um, builds. Uh, that is going to be, make the the game experience very diff different, and hopefully, you know. Um, it's going to motivate for replayability and also a multiplayer component, which is not obvious in the trailer. <laughs> There's there's definitely a place for both types of protagonists. I think we need both. I think we need preset yeah. characters, and I think we need customer uh, c custom creation uh, type protagonists. And there's a both are necessary, and I think in our industry, so I, it's always curious to see which path a team goes down. But it's still exciting to hear that even with a uh, going the more narrative focused preset character so strategy, that there still seems to be like a lot of. Uh, player involvement so yeah. you know things like you said romance options and other types of like customization in terms of gameplay that that's really exciting to me but the thing that excited me the most was the uh the mention of a morality system i feel yeah. like we don't see morality systems very often anymore and it's something that can be really cool i my, my all-time favorite my all-time favorite game is mass effect and that mm -hmm. was one of the games that 
I would say pioneered or at least was very prominently well known to have for its morality system. So it's always cool to see that in a game, especially where you're talking about how it's going to be a lot less black and white. It's not just evil choice, bad, cho good choice. You know, this is what the good guy would say is, is it sounds like it's going to be a little bit more gray, a little bit more complex. Yeah. Could you tell maybe just elaborate real quick about a little bit more about like how are you achieving a little bit more gray, a little bit more complexity in that in that morality system? Well, actually, yeah. Um, well, the morality system came from like like you said, it's it's not so often that you see a game with that. Actually, uh, even before Mass Effect, which I of course I played, but you have uh, Knight of the Old Republic, mm. and if you go way way back to 1997, you had. Uh, it was very basic, but you have the first Jedi Knight, in which if, if, oh, you, if, you, if you randomly kill civilians, you basically went to the dark side <laughs> because there was no dialogue. So it was very blunt. But yeah, it, actually, it was the first time that I encountered uh, as a kid a morality system. It was very interesting to me. So so yeah, in this particular case uh, of witches, uh, because in Mass Effect, of course, you have your your Paragon and your Renegade, mm -hmm. and uh, of course, it was also a little bit blunt. I like, you know, well, I slapped Fair the reporter in the face. You know, it's like, okay, oh, that's obviously wrong. But this interview is of, over. This interview is over. Yeah, but in the case of of Witches of the New World, uh, because of the religious, um, you know, tribalism of the region, because uh, of course, uh, I'm not going to disclose exactly the, the the beliefs of the main character, but across the the region, you're going to have uh, you know, people like that still believe in the paganism. That is not necessarily uh, Satanism. Uh, like the Celtic belief in nature, and you're of course you're going to have indigenous population, and you're going to have slaves that came from 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 Barbados and the Caribbean island that believed something completely different, and then different tribes of uh, Puritans, you know, from uh, Calvinists to Quakers, and uh, an occasional Catholic that is unpassed because after all, sail sailing was a port. So in that regard, uh, the main characters, there is no way for you to, to, to align with the forces of the devil, uh, per se, but there's like uh, different ways to be pious. And that's where the morality system is going to, to move because, you know, you can be a merciful religious person and you can be an, you know, uptight, self-righteous, vengeful uh, person. So, and, you know, some, well, some characters are, you're going to see some situations where the characters are asking for it. So, you know, it's not going to be so, so black and white because in the end, the character cannot, cannot go completely, you know, demonic and evil so it's always moved between between the confines of how people uh, interpret uh, their beliefs and how they act upon them so that's that's where we were writing these kind of choices is yeah it's very ambiguous and and, and, and difficult to 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 predict um, I like I like that because when gamers hear morality system, they might think, "Oh, well, I can be a you know a really like the bad thing go really bad or they go really <laughs> evil." So like it's interesting to hear that you can have a morality system with all these complexities without it just being like going full on villain um, or very very like evil. So like that that's really cool to see that that level of complexity, and I think that's where morality systems could evolve to in more yeah. games. Uh, is because you're right. The examples that we we both mentioned are very black and white systems, very blunt, very <laughs> um, very binary. So having a much more complex spectrum of things is is, is cool and exciting to me. Um, so the let's let's shift gears just a little bit real quick and just talk okay. a little bit about your guys' company, your team, this this development cycle. It's been a, it's a couple years in, and what what would you guys say just maybe talking to some of the other developers out there. We have a lot of developers in our audience as we've mm -hmm. made all these relationships with other developers doing these. What would you say has been your challenge that you guys have had to overcome? And what's your favorite part about being an indie developer? And like, what, what's the, what's the biggest challenge that you've had to overcome? And what's, what's the thing that you've enjoyed most about this journey? Okay. Okay. Um, when it comes to challenge, well, um, the region, the region is, is difficult to sell. Overall, I mean, um, we do have a couple of, and in fact, right now, I believe that uh, Funcom for Conan Exiles is, is employing uh, the services of a Brazilian company, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, but overall, you know, it's very hard. It's very hard, even 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 if I in Mexico, which is right next right next to the U.S. and it's a service country uh, by nature. Uh, yeah, it's really hard to sell to a publisher that oh well, we want to do this, you know, one 
XX million dollars game. And we are a team from Mexico. And it's like, well, in which Assassin's Creed have you worked before? Well, <laughs> in none. <laughs> so, so yeah, there is a mistrust um, on the capacity of the professionals in the region, mostly because, yeah, the industry here is very young uh, still. So, yeah, the, the, the process with the publishers has been quite difficult, specifically for the because of the scope, also the scope of the game, which is something that you... Mm, doesn't normally see coming out of Latin America, which I've, we have we we have had a couple of you know hits now and then, um, like Mulaka, which was developed by Lienzo Studio, which I believe they are based in Chihuahua. Um, yeah, that was for for the Nintendo Switch. It was kind of popular, but again, very small in in scope, and it was funding. It was funded uh, right here by a Mexican. Uh, uh, entrepreneur so yeah when you go out there and, and with this kind of scope uh it's difficult to get that first impression then well is the team going to be able to to accomplish this in fact some of the publishers that we encounter uh you know were like well person by person in the in the pitch you know team uh slide what has he done what has he done one by one so so yeah that's part is difficult um it's probably has been the most challenge thing about developing because yeah uh technology wise i mean we this is our first actually game in on the under in unreal engine we have done services in unreal engine but we haven't developed a complete game in unreal engine so uh with the new tools of unreal engine 5 i mean and, and we have a lot of talented developers i mean we have you know achieved uh to get to a place in which you know we are we are comfortable with where with our development skills in that regard but yeah, uh, when you get to sell, uh, it doesn't matter the trailer that you have or the or the you know prototype or vertical slice that you have. You're going to encounter that first wall. That well, can I trust you? Uh, coming from the region, and yeah, it's understandable. I mean, at its time, it, it was the same for Poland, which now is you know you have CD Projekt Red there and you know Bluebird team and you know this in in Czech Republic you have Workhorse, which made you know. Um, Kingdom Come Deliverance, uh, but at the start it's, it's, it's complicated uh, for a developer to well, I prefer I rather go to a guy this, you know, that already done this and this and this game, and you know the team all of them have working small or big games before instead of just services. Uh, so yeah, that's the biggest challenge. And uh, but um, on the other hand, uh, well, especially since we have worked a lot of services, outsourced services, it's refreshing to be. To have 100% creative freedom in a project, uh, instead of you know uh, submitting your your creativity to the project of somebody else, so that's always a blast to have. And you know the the kind of conversations that you that goes around uh, in meeting calls and you know and brainstormings. You know we are free to do whatever we want. Um, so yeah, I, I believe that that is the most exciting part. And uh, of course that 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 creates an unhealthy uh our work hours uh, for the team <laughs> some of us have to have developed these uh, conditions regarding sleeping uh for the last couple of months which is obviously not nice but hey we're having fun i mean what <laughs> what work hours right they're, they're just all as, <laughs> as um as someone who's so game infinite is is my passion project that i've worked on for years okay and it's one of those things where like it's always been the thing that sometimes i'm working on it randomly because i still have a day job and uh this is so, like past projects oh, so I, I can totally understand yeah how when you when you're working on something that is your creative baby that you it, it it's really hard to it, you don't have hours it's just always on you're always yeah. working on it random times lunch break here break there late, late night here and it's just that constant um so i i can understand at least a little bit i'm not a developer so I've, i have no idea what it takes to build a game but i can at least relate a little bit to to understanding what it's like to work on your passion project um, but I want to also highlight what you were saying about the challenge. Um, you're actually not the first developer that I've talked to that's had a similar uh, experience. And one thing that I'm starting to notice is when we have, a, I know a lot of solo devs and as the teams grow and we're getting into this medium sized developer team, the maybe five up to 30, what, whatever, the number is a little arbitrary, but like mm -hmm. the medium sized indie teams that are working on bigger projects than what you might see from indie um 
there there's that growing pain of publishers like they're just like it's a it's a bigger game with a bigger team so it's a bigger risk and yeah. they're more hesitant to want to support that and there's a lot more pushback and it's it's that growing pain of like you're not a tiny team operating by yourself you know there's no publisher to worry about and you're not you have this is this is the first big project you guys are working on so there's no history so like dealing with publishers for these medium sized teams is you're not the first one to give that feedback and it's one of those things that it might be iterative of the industries our industry is becoming more and more like hesitant to taking risks as games yes. get bigger and more expensive and harder and we're seeing that even trickle up to the AAA where they're taking less risks, they're being more scared, um, they're making more stupid decisions. <laughs> <laughs> um, exactly, yeah. And I mean, that's, the, the, that's trickling down to you guys. And Yes, yes. I mean, they're, they're, right now there is a, a bit of a limbo also because of the, the economic state of the overall world mm -hmm. uh, has affected the industry uh, a little bit. But yeah, there's also, um, there's a lot of offer right now i mean there are tons of game be being you know announced and developed on a daily basis so so yeah basically what the publishers are looking for right now is right uh, either a very 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 you know non-expensive or low budget uh title or something that is all right you have a high budget but it's nearly completed uh and they can really you know run by focus group and start to you know make a little bit more, more market research uh, how the game is going to be received but yeah i mean a couple of years back i mean i, I saw it even with clients i mean with a you know a pitch and a trailer was enough yeah uh, right now it's, it's 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 sometimes to me the the, the weirdest thing because I, I i've worked in in cinema back in back in venezuela a little bit and of course i mean you presented you know your treatment and your synopsis and there we go and right now is in, in the video game industry my experience has been uh, very strange because well we need a prototype and a, with the core mechanics and a vertical slice with a, show all the mechanics which is basically the most complicated <laughs> thing to program from the game. After that, it's basically asset, asset management and, you know, make it look uh, pretty and, you know, obviously polish a lot of what you have done. But, you know, it's kind of like backwards, like, you know, right, make the movie and when it's ready, <laughs> we can discuss the marketing. Yeah. And it's something like that with Publisher, which I, I didn't expect. Uh, also because, well, what you see from, from Legends and from other eras of the industry, yeah, I mean, they they went just with the pitch. In fact, I, I you can you can still find the the Diablo one pitch, uh, some places in the internet, which is basically a word with some drawings, a word document with some drawings. I mean, <laughs> it was really basic, but you know, it sell the idea. Mm -hmm. uh, and right now, yeah, you need to be very on into the into the production or have the backup or have or having created already, a, a, you know, some sort of hit, at least you know mid ground hit. And yeah, in, in Latin America, well, there's no such thing. So you need to get creative, you know, you need to get uh, knock on doors, you know, or direct investment, not necessarily publishers before you even can get a publishing deal. And right now we are, you know, like in that ordeal. We have had uh, a lot of help um, and a lot of uh, support from the people of Epic Games. Uh, you know about the the working on some of the engines, and they're trying to to build also a community of developers here in in, in the Latin region. So yeah, the, it's having a blast, and they are also very exciting for the game. And uh, also we have received very good feedback from major publishers. But yeah, uh, we're still in negotiations. Nobody has you know is ready right now to jump and fund the game uh, at the time being. But yeah, you know one step at a time. I mean this this and my boss you know warned me about this. You know. A lot of people is going to be interesting. A bunch of them is going to say no, but in the end, you only need one to say yes, and that's enough. So, I, I think in the indie space, the gaming industry has two really big problems. Um, one is just general game awareness, getting gamers aware of indie games, and um, the, the second one is the problem that we're discussing about as teams transition from very small to larger, working on these medium-sized projects, getting. The, you know, the, they're finally getting big enough to partner up with publishers and trying to build these larger projects. I think the two problems are related because yeah. if we could solve the problem we're discussing, it would help with video game awareness because it would incentivize cons consolidation. So to give a counter example, uh, I, and I mentioned, I, I briefly touched on this in one of the other interviews, but I was talking with a solo developer who already released their game. The game was out. Not a lot of people were playing it. Not a lot of people were seeing it. He was 
when he came to me, we were just talking and he was like, well, how do I get more people to see my game? What, what advice do you have? And I was just like, this game's a cool idea, but I, I can just imagine how much cooler it would be if you had eight other people turning this into a project that could be bigger. It would maybe be a bigger game. And I was like, this game came out next to 150 others in this yeah. month. And that's the that's going back to that first problem is game awareness is that I think the two problems are related. We, I, I, I have a somewhat controversial opinion for a amateur games journalist, but I think too many games are made, and I and I know yes. that's kind of a scary thing to say to a developer. And <laughs> as, as we're literally in an event celebrating amazing games, when I say that there are too many, in that we need to solve for the games awareness. Um, it's not that we have too many, but we're we're not getting enough of them shared with people, and that's what I really mean by that. Is that too many meaning for the current system to handle letting people know because i think yes when we the reason i made game infinite in the first place was because i was working with devs in school who some one 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 game had been in development for like 10 years in my town and i oh, had God. never heard of it before <laughs> and that's what really uh, clued me into the idea that the current system we have the ign the game spots the that they highlight a, like five or 10 indie games and they're all like if you and you i love doing our end of end of the year lists and one thing that i find fascinating is that when you just look at all of the indie games that come out in a given year and then you compare that to the few that are covered by the big outlets i always ask the question of how many really fantastic games do gamers amazing. just never hear of so yeah. I, go to, I go to conventions i i, I scour the internet and i come across amazing games that no one's heard of before there was one game from last year that the thing was fantastic it went it made it onto our top 10 list and i didn't see a single outlet cover it <laughs> no ign no GameSpot, nobody and this was a big budget big high production game and i'm like that tells me that the system just picks three or four and then the rest are just left to you know to luck and that's why we yeah. need to make the system better and that's why i like doing these because if we can increase gamer awareness about indie devs what goes into making these games i think we the first way to solve a problem is to get people more people to know about it so there's more people that can help fix it and talking about this problem of like we need publishers to take bigger chances on medium-sized indie games because medium-sized indie games are easier to share with people because <laughs> yeah, they're bigger they're, projects the um, mid shelf kind of kind of game but yeah i i can relate to to what you're saying actually i i do believe that of course we're, we're not in the same economy but uh the market the, the market is, is is behaving like there were going to be another game crash like mm -hmm. the one from the you know 70s 80s final 70s 80s i don't remember but yeah because yeah there's too much offer right now uh the quality is not necessarily consistent but like you said there are great games that get get completely overlooked uh well uh for for what we have went through not only with our game but also with some client games it, it might relate to to maybe um a party's budget obviously because if you are uh, you know if you have a little bit of money you can you know your game is going to be a premiere in a major event and uh, the other is, uh, well, lack of marketing strategy. I mean, uh, thankfully, which is how you find out about my game, <laughs> I, I, I worked for like um, close to seven or eight years in, in, in advertisement um, in Venezuela while I was doing a little bit with cinema. And uh, yeah, so uh, we did we, we did a, a little bit of, you know, social marketing campaign, social media campaign, actually the, all the followers that we have across Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter, that 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 was made in a week. And after that, because I was doing it by myself and I needed to do other stuff. So yeah, I stopped during the week of the GDC. You know, I put all, all on that. I mean, I, I was like 36 straight hours just planning the, the strategy and the campaign. And then we did a little bit of, of media strategy and yeah, actually IGN uh, published the, the trailer as it came out the first day of the you know of the of the GDC and that gave us a lot of uh you know uh, replication across the web and we end up with I'm, I still you know do a little bit of counting on the media side and we have like in Pakistan or Russia and it was like what <laughs> how they find out you know and uh yeah by now we're are around you know 100 
different media outlets. Actually, Japan had a little in, very interesting response because, the, yeah, the IGN community destroyed the trailer. But yeah, <laughs> but yeah, it, it was yeah, there was complete. It was brutal. But yeah, I I I, I forgot how the IGN community was, and yeah, uh, it was like, wait, this, there's a Need for Speed game. Let's see how is that. And also just negative comments, you know, oh, <laughs> and all basically every single game that the same comments. And oh, it's not me. <laughs> it's, it's the comment sections. Okay, that's fine. But yeah, for example, yeah, uh, the Japanese uh, media outlets have very, very positive, uh, you know, comments about the teaser, and also, yeah, Russia was a little bit, uh, you know, mixed, and you know, then and countries like Cyprus or Italy, and well, I I haven't translated those, I don't know what they're saying, uh, but yeah, uh, it's basically of and of course luck, a little bit of luck, because actually we find a, a, a Latin American guy working for. As, a, as an outsource for IGN, and he was like, "Oh my God, you're doing you're doing this in Latam. I, I wanna, you know, I wanna run this by IGN and see if we can publish it." So, yeah, there was a little, little bit of luck factor there. But yeah, we we went with the idea of you know, even though we are really really early into into development still, uh, let's test it. Let's test test what we have with the final consumer for the you know, for the for the for the target that we're going, which is not necessarily Latam. We're going, you know. UK, US, the big markets, and see what the people say about them, what we're doing. And the feedback has been, you know, good. Uh, I mean, brutal in some cases, but also good. But yeah, the the marketing, the marketing side, the, the marketing aspect, you you can leave out. Uh, and, and also, even some of the publishers that have, hey, look, you're making this game. Can we know more about it? It has been because, you know, putting a little bit of effort in social media, putting a little bit of effort in media and media outlets, you know, and, and press. And, you know, sometimes developers that we have worked on, even from Europe, yeah, you know, they're making the game. They go to the they go to the uh, to the events, but the social media is completely dead. So nobody knows that the games exist. So so yeah, you have to put also the time and the and the and the funds and the efforts to cover that side because, you know, it doesn't matter how good is your game if people doesn't know it exists. Uh, well, you're not gonna get, go that far. You uh you hit it right there on the head with that, and that's exactly it's a big part of why I do what I do. And I I know there I there's two different types of developers when it comes to this attitude of how we talk about this, and there are developers that treat the marketing and the networking and the outreach and the, the awareness as not important. They they have this this idea that if you just if you just build a good game, everyone's going to play it. And that 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 can be true and that can happen, but it's it's so competitive. Whereas the, there's developers that are much more like you that are taking this attitude of like we need to put just as much effort into telling people about the game as we can building the game. And that's those are the games that get heard of by IGN and the fact that you even made it to one of the biggest names in gaming journalism tells me that you put in that effort and uh, you're absolutely right there. There are developers that their social media is just not active and it's not that developers, development's not important, but there are developers that don't realize just how important it is. And, and I see that and I, and I know, yeah. the develop, I know when a development studio is that way versus when they're not, because I, I can tell with how they interact with me. Cause like we're, we're a small gaming entertainment page. So I understand that we may not be big enough to get some games, but the attitude of how a developer even reacts to our little bit of free help. Like it, there are ones that like don't even respond or, you know, ignore that type. And it's like, if you're saying no to free help and you're not super large, <laughs> then you're doing it wrong. There, there yeah. You have a we, problem. Definitely. We, we've approached developers and like, Hey, like, what can we do to help support your game and show your trailer, do this, do that, the other thing. And they either never respond or, or say, no, you know, thank you. Or, exactly. And I'm just <laughs> like, what? so you don't want free help. Okay. All right. Um, and I, I get it. I'm, I'm not, I'm not putting all of that down. Some people turn it down for good reasons. Like it's too early and they say that like sometimes the game's too early to show stuff. Um, but I, there's definitely, that's not, I wouldn't say that that's the norm, but I could definitely, there's a, there's a subset of developers that just don't think it's important. And when they're going to release their games, some of them are going to be surprised that, not enough people know about it. It could be yeah, amazing, I mean, but no uh, one knows about it. it, it it's difficult because actually, uh, uh, when I get when I get into the company, which the company was already existent when I when I arrived, and uh, yeah, most people did, don't didn't really get when I was 
talking about when I talk about, about advertisement and and yeah, but to me it's basically it's a mix of of working specifically in the advertisement industry and the filmmaking industry and combining two basic concepts uh, from that industry, which from filmmaking, well, if you're going to make uh, two million dollar movies, you're going to expend two million dollars in advertisement. I mean, it's a 50-50. Uh, and that's a, basically a rule uh, in filmmaking. Obviously, uh, the, the numbers can vary, <laughs> yeah. but yeah, that's the, how the saying goes. And uh, in advertisement is, well, there's no such thing as bad publicity. So yeah, we, in fact, we, we went, uh, you might consider early uh, in showing the game to the final public, but that also gave us a lot of feedback in what, what we need to fix and, uh, and what we need to improve from our process specifically when, when it comes to graphics. And uh, also, well, that's why a little bit of uh, on purpose because there has been a lot of talk in some sites uh, like because it's not like super clear the teaser trailer about who the character is, who are you fighting, but it says Salem, you know, it says witches, and you know, if you go to some some you know some social media sites and some subreddits and stuff, there's people like, oh, how dare they make a game about a witch hunter that is killing innocent women in the 17th century? And the game is not about that, but you know, that's kind of a suicide advertisement because yeah, I want to. If God willing, you know, go in 2024 with a, with a, another trailer uh, that basically talk, talks more about what the game is about and, you know, this precisely this tribalism and kind of discerning, you know, who is innocent, who is guilty, who is his, who is good, who is bad, you know, even within their own uh, uh, their own people of Salem and their own, you know, self-righteous uh, religious figures. Um, so, yeah, but, you know, it, it was a, a calculated trap. <laughs> and many people will fell for it and you know they are they are talking a lot about the game negatively but that's good publicity because there's no such thing as bad advertisement so yeah i mean um i did that without the approval of my boss because he would have said no obviously <laughs> uh, so yeah it's better to ask for forgiveness that for permission like they said so but yeah i mean the the is even even he, he, i mean he has a lot of uh of of experience he is an ex ubisoft from france uh, he made oh, a company okay. here. Yeah, he made a company here in Mexico. His name is uh, Adrian Himare Welch. Uh, actually, yeah, he has a, an impressive curriculum. But yeah, he he didn't like the idea of investing too much in publicity, which I completely understand because development is very expensive. So that's why. Well, can I do it if I do it by myself? Yeah, go ahead and do it. And that's when the you know working hour cycle becomes dangerous. <laughs> and uh, but yeah, I mean, with the results, of course, he's now completely on board. And then you know we're looking at also marketing for other parts of the company. And you know it's it's it's, it's nice. That's awesome. Uh, so my last question really is okay. just focusing on the future. We talked a lot about about development up until now. We know it's been in development for a couple of years. I'd I'd love to hear just lastly just a little bit about the roadmap. What what does the next year or two look like? Do we have a release year or window that you guys are trying to shoot for? What's the next stage in the roadmap? Will there be a, a Kickstarter, a demo, a beta? When will players be first be able to try it out? And do we have like a release window for final release? What's your guys' roadmap look like? Okay. Um, of what you can so basically, share. Yeah, what I can share right now is uh, we, are, we are aiming from the beginning, uh, which is you know, our roadmap have stayed the same, which is a good sign. Uh, but yeah, we're aiming for 2025. Okay. However, that might change. I mean, right now we are uh, we are aiming, you know, for, like I said, we're negotiating publishers, investors. We have considered uh, crowdfunding, uh, which takes a lot of, of, of marketing work. Uh, and even, I mean, uh, I, uh, me and the team, you know, we don't want to go there. Uh, right now until there is you know our very very uh, last option because you know the crowdfunding has changed over the years obviously I, I i remember where star citizen made all the noise in the world about oh, crowdfunding star and king star. yeah i mean no I, i'm super excited about star citizen i mean I, i'm a i'm a you know a space jockey i mean i have my warthog hodas here i mean i love space sim but yeah i mean um he he they did great but at the same time, uh, one of the developers from, I believe, Tie Fighters, which is considered to be one of the most, if not the 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 best, uh, space sim in the world, uh, he 
launch a Kickstarter campaign and he didn't make the cut. So yeah, because you have a lot of in video games, uh, not only in Kickstarter for across, you know, uh, crowdfunding, you have a lot of video games that are either scams or never get done. And, you know, so people have, I believe that, that, uh, that kind of goodwill that we have when Star Citizen was able to make all the money in the world uh, has kind of disappeared. So yeah, and it's a lot of time and, and effort uh, of marketing that you have to do just to make a functioning campaign. So yeah, we don't want to go there just yet. We still have uh, you know good options uh, within the investors and publisher side. Uh, so yeah, uh, I believe that uh, if if we if we get signed really soon, yeah, the roadmap is going to stay uh, for 2025, and uh, yeah, and if that happens, well, I, we already have a roadmap for after launch content, um, big and small, and uh, yeah, and a roadmap for the IP itself, uh, which is centered around uh, this titular char character for the most part, but in different, like I said, in different historical. Uh, in different historical uh, event, uh, you know, surrounding time frames, and uh, not as you know, maybe not as, as big of Assassin's Creed like you know the American Revolution. Like if if you, if you see, you know, the Witch Trial of Salem is more of a historic curiosity. So that kind of thing is that we're aiming for, you know, the kind of these historical curiosities that that you find around superstition, uh, which in the case of vampires you can you can find a lot in Eastern Europe. Um, area so so yeah uh, but yeah our plan is to make this into a, a you know a lasting ip with several games uh so yeah let's see what happens after 2025 well that's awesome i know i'm very excited um it looks really cool i i want to i want to thank you for taking um time out of your evening i know it was a little this was a little bit more of a later interview um so i want to thank you for your time i know d uh, indie development is very busy work and like you said it's it's crazy uh, hours. i don't know uh, this, it, uh, what you're talking about this is the, the, the exactly the half of my day i mean i still have a <laughs> long way to go today uh, as as one night owl to another, I could totally appreciate how like late at night is like the middle of one's day. I yeah, um, that's that's hilarious. Uh, <laughs> uh, for those of you watching, uh, I want to uh, uh, make you all aware of a couple things. Uh, so, uh, Witches of the New World will be part of the Game Infinite Indie Game Showcase for Infinite Summer Twenty Three. So, stay tuned to see the trailer again. Uh, and I'm just really excited to learn more about this game. So thank you for this develop. Uh, make sure to check out Witches of the New World on social media so you can stay up to date on their development, of course. And follow at Game Infinite on Instagram, at Game Infinite 10 on Twitter for what we'll do to help support news coming from Witches of the New World. William, once again, we have the creative director of Witches of the New World. Thank you for joining us. And for those of you watching, uh, we'll see you guys on the next Game Infinite video. I love the chase and the hunt and I set the pace when I'm running. I always take what I want and I always give it 100. Don't need a bank, no I'm funded. Play the game like it's nothing. I'm always thankful for something. Don't take for granted, stay humble. Now wake up! It's time to look at the enemy.